Good evening, everyone. I'm R.C. McBride. I'm general manager of WGLT, which for those of you who don't know, is the NPR member radio station owned by Illinois State University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the virtual version of Illinois State University's three-minute thesis competition finals sponsored by the Graduate School. We're really excited that we are still able to do this given all the circumstances and we have some wonderful, wonderful contestants uh, coming up here in just a few moments. So what exactly is a three minute thesis? For those of you who don't know, the three minute thesis started out as a competition at the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008 and it is spread across the world since then. The essence of the competition is for students to condense their research into a short presentation, you know, an elevator speech that they can give to anyone, not just a special to a specialty audience. Students will have three minutes and one static slide for the duration of their presentation. If they go over three minutes, they're disqualified. They will be ranked on the basis of communication, delivery, and organization. The nine graduate students you'll be hearing from tonight were chosen from their respective college competitions. And tonight's winner will move on to compete at the Midwestern Association of Graduate Schools contest. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce a few special guests who are joining us tonight. And uh, again, typically we would maybe have them give us a quick wave. Uh, obviously it's a little more difficult to do that tonight, but we do want to recognize their in attendance. Of course, it includes Illinois State University President Larry Dietz, ISU Provost Andave Tarhule, Associate Vice President for Research and Graduate Studies, Dr. Craig McLaughlin, our college deans and associate deans, as well as our department chairs, and of course, everyone from the graduate school who put so much into planning for this event. I'd also like to introduce our panel of judges for this evening. We have with us three judges. First, Bob Augustine, Senior Vice President Emeritus, Council of Graduate Schools in Washington, DC. We also have Sandy Groves, Professor Emerita, and Dr. John Bauer, former Associate VP of Research and Graduate Studies. A little bit later on tonight, we will hear Marina Teplova on piano, who will be performing for us while all the final votes are being tallied. And we thank her for her talent and efforts this evening. We also want to thank everyone who has participated so far today in the Birds Give Back fundraising effort. And of course, just a friendly reminder that it's never too late. Lastly, though, we'd like to thank you, everyone who is joining us from wherever you may be tonight, uh, just to watch, learn, observe. And certainly while our judges will be determining the first and second prize winners, you all will have an opportunity. You alone will vote to determine the People's Choice Award. After the presentations, again, we'll have that brief intermission I referred to earlier. And while you vote for the People's Choice Award winner, we will tally the scores from our judges. So hopefully we are all ready to go. We wish all of our students the best of luck and we look forward to hearing their presentations. First up is our first presenter from the College of Applied Sciences and Technology, Jessica Barrick. In college, I went to a cadaver lab where I was able to hold a human brain in my hands. As I was holding the brain, I thought to myself, this is not just any organ of the body. This is who this person was, their thoughts, their emotions, their memories, their personality. When managing an injury to the brain, such as a concussion, we need to remember that we're not just dealing with any organ of the body. We are dealing with what makes a person who they are. It should be a no brainer that clinicians should treat the patient as a whole and not just the injury itself. However, this isn't always the case. Concussions are a growing public health concern. As many as 3.8 million concussions occur in the US per year and as many as 50% may go unreported. 
This is a major concern as emerging possible long-term health risks may negatively impact an individual's quality of life. With concussions, there can be a diverse multitude of signs and symptoms, but the most frequent and underreported long-term sequelae of concussions are mood disturbances such as anxiety and depression and sleep disturbances such as troubles initiating or retaining sleep. Despite the high prevalence of these symptoms, only few clinicians include mood and sleep disturbances in their concussion assessment and management plan. When these impairing mood and sleep disturbances are ignored or improperly managed, it can lead to worsened conditions such as clinical depression, clinical anxiety, and even suicidal ideation and intent that can persist and linger for years after a head injury. As a consequence, for prolonged depression and anxiety, risk for suicide is elevated approximately 10 years after concussion, even if the individual did not present with any mood disorders prior to injury. But by further examining anxiety, depression, and sleep disturbances following concussion, clinicians may be able to improve management in those factors that may prolong recovery. Although many studies have found that a history of concussions can cause long-term anxiety and depression, most conclude with, but more research is needed. Well, now is the time to determine this relationship. With the use of my survey that includes highly reliable mental health and sleep quality questionnaires and an advanced statistical analysis called structural equation modeling, my study will examine the significance of relationships in sleep quality and prevalence of mood disturbances in healthy young adults with and without a history of concussions. I hypothesize that history of concussions may directly impact anxiety and depression, but sleep quality mediates this relationship. Mood and sleep disturbances are major elements missing in the assessment of concussion and recovery, and clinicians should assess one's changes to mood and sleep in order to minimize these prolonged disturbances that can negatively affect the quality of life. The results of my study will help clinicians not only understand the relationship of emotional symptoms with concussions, but to better evaluate and manage concussed individuals by treating the patient as a whole and not just the injury itself. Thank you. And just a reminder for everyone that the time between our presentations is there to give our judges ample time for their scoring tonight. Our next presenter is from the College of Applied Science and Technology, Rayanne Huffman. As you drive around Illinois, you see vast fields filled with only one species of crop, known as monoculture farming. Filling those vast wide open spaces are corn or soybeans. Corn is a grass plant which requires more nitrogen than other crops in order to grow. Despite well over 70% of our atmosphere being composed of nitrogen, plants require a different form. Nitrogen fertilizers that producers are applying have gained attention nationally because it's overapplied and it's largely responsible for eutrophication, like the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and other small bodies of water right here in Illinois. In our current agriculture system, nitrogen is being applied as a synthetic fertilizer, and predominantly it's being added before the crops actually need it. For example, it can be applied as early as eight months before the crop needs it. On the other hand, soybeans don't require the application of nitrogen in order to grow. Soybeans form a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in the soil, rhizobium bacterium, which can convert some of the nitrogen that's housed in our atmosphere into a plant usable form. We've always been taught that soybeans are selfish and only produce enough nitrogen for themselves. So in my thesis study, corn and soybeans were planted together in the same field at the same time, which can be described as intercropping. We want to test if the bacteria associated with soybeans could provide plant usable nitrogen for both corn and soybeans, while also not applying any other source of nitrogen to any of the treatments. Multiple fields were grown. Pictured in the bottom left corner is the experimental design. We grew two popular corn management practices in monoculture, two popular soybean management practices in monoculture, and the intercropping system. In the picture, there's a presence of a darker green in the corn within the intercropping treatment, which can commonly be assumed to be associated with nitrogen. Nutrients, and especially nitrogen, drive grain yield. To test this, we took sample, tissue samples, which indicated that there was a statistically significant increase within the nitrogen content in the corn plants within the intercropping plots. 
When talking about corn yield and soybean yield, it's like comparing apples to oranges. You can't directly do it. So to compare the different plots, we had to convert grain yield to profit. The results showed that we can get more profit per area with the intercropping system than any other monocropping technique. Something about the two types of crops being grown together allowed for a synergistic effect in terms of value of grain produced. We're hopeful that the aspects of this research can be used to improve profitability of farmers and to lessen the negative impacts of growing monocrop corn and soybeans. Thank you. Our next presenter this evening is from the College of Arts and Sciences, Amity Wise. So how often have we seen those studies that focus on mar marginalized populations? You know those studies about urban youth or the perspectives of students of color. These studies investigate the problems within these populations and how those individuals function with the obstacles in place against them. But me being a somewhat skeptical individual always thought, okay, well, what about the other side of that coin? There is so much talk about marginalized populations, but they never seem to really touch on non-marginalized populations. But it seems only logical. If there is a marginalized population, then there must be a non-marginalized population. If there are underprivileged groups, then there must be privileged groups. Because if not, where are these terms coming from? People of color cannot be marginalized unless there is some other group benefiting from the privileges of society. So this brings us to my thesis question. How do the individual's awareness of their white privilege impact how they perceive microaggressions? I know, I know, I'm throwing out words that we haven't quite touched on yet, but bear with me, I promise, it'll all make sense in less than two minutes. So when researching white privilege, I found that many white Americans adopt a colorblind approach to race simply meaning they do not see color. For example, we have the fan favorite, we are all the same race, the human race. Although sometimes well-intentioned, this discredits people of color's identity and their experiences. So it is no surprise that studies show that individuals who do not see color are also less likely to see the problematic nature of subtle, discriminatory, or prejudicial behaviors, also known as microaggressions. Additionally, individuals who do not see color are more likely to deny they hold white privilege. But wait, there is more. Individuals who report more awareness about their white privilege also report greater awareness about racism and lower levels of prejudice. I mean, come on, how could I not further investigate these connections? So after collecting data from over 400 white participants, I found that white privilege awareness explained the relationship between people's tendency to not see color and their ability to identify offensive behaviors or actions. In other words, white people who are colorblind are less likely to notice microaggressions because they don't think they're privileged, but white people who recognize their white privilege are more likely to notice these transgressions because they are at least aware that they hold a racial privilege that others do not. So you may be wondering, okay, Omni, but what does that mean past you completing your thesis? Well, this is extremely useful for future studies in microaggression awareness training. These studies can develop methods to target colorblind attitudes and white privilege to not only minimize the occurrence of microaggressions, but also improve responses after microaggressions have occurred. And given today's climate, wouldn't that just be swell? Thank you. Our next presenter this evening is from the College of Arts and Sciences, Whitney Green. Due to an ongoing pandemic in our world today, we are hearing a lot about the immune system and antibodies. This is what I study. When we compare the oldest living tortoise at 250 years to the oldest living human at 122 years, who seems to be aging better? Would it surprise you to hear that it might be the tortoise? The immune system plays an important role in the ability for an organism to live a long and healthy life. While it has been studied extensively in humans, very little is known about the immune response in reptiles. My thesis work has been to better understand the reptile immune system using a local pond turtle, the red-eared slider, as a model organism. Now, turtles are known for their longevity, and their immune system appears to play an important role in their ability to survive. While the immune response of humans tends to decline with old age, it seems that the older a turtle becomes, the more successful their immune response is in protecting them from the many microbes that are found within their environment. So what is it about turtles that give them this ability? To answer this question, I investigate turtle white blood cells. 
My main interest is in understanding the function of B cells in these turtles. Now, B cells are a type of white blood cell that play a vital role in the immune response of humans. Depicted in figure three, the majority secrete antibodies that are marking invading bacterial cells to be destroyed. Now, there are a few B cells that do have the ability to ingest a pathogen directly in order to get rid of it. Essentially, picture Pac-Man eating a pathogen. So we know that red-eared slider turtles have B cells, but we do not know how their B cells are functioning or which function may be more important. Understanding the function of these B cells in the red-eared sliders may give us a better idea of how they're aging so successfully. I am interested in knowing if their B cells are able to secrete antibodies and ingest pathogens, or if they are similar to human B cells and the fact that they are confined to doing only one or the other, as you can see in figure four. Interestingly, my data suggests that unlike in humans, B cells in the red-eared slider can do both. They are able to secrete antibodies after they have ingested a pathogen. Um, as you can see from the graph, in the absence of infection, B cells are resting and are not secreting antibodies. Chemically activated B cells that did not ingest anything made a lot of antibodies as expected. Surprisingly, when B cells had ingested a microbe, they were still able to produce a large amount of these antibodies. Now, more research needs to be completed to really understand the exact role of these B cells, but we now see a glimpse of how their immune system may differ from that of humans. My research is important because these differences may be the secret to improving human health as we age. Thank you. Our next presenter this evening from the College of Applied Science and Technology, Jessica Brahm. Imagine working your whole life to accomplish your dream. And when you finally make it, you are suddenly under pressure and scrutiny from coaches other students, fans, and complete strangers, all of whom are judging your every move. In your new world, when you fail, people have the confidence and anonymity to tell you that you aren't worthy, don't work hard enough, and that you should kill yourself because you failed. This is a common experience for college student athletes across the country who fall victim to harassment from both fans and foes of their teams. Losses on the field or in the arena not only cause distress in the moment, but lead to constant reminders of failure from complete strangers. The purpose of my thesis was to explore the impact of social media on the mental health of student athletes. This is important as it provides opportunity to educate athletic departments and student athletes on the dangers of social media use. To do so, I created a survey that explores social media use and various mental health measures. Student athletes were asked when they use social media, where they use it, and what social media applications they use. Then they took a variety of mental health measures, including anxiety, depression, burnout, stress, and satisfaction with life scales. From this, I was able to determine relationships between social media use and mental health issues. The NCAA, which governs much of college sport, is a large entity with approximately 1,100 schools over three divisions and 176,000 student athletes. Therefore, I examined differences across sport, divisions, and gender. I reached out to over 100 Division I, 20 Division II, and 20 Division III institutions to collect my data. When analyzed, results indicated that social media use had a negative impact on mental health of student athletes. More specifically, Division II and graduate student athletes were at a higher risk of depression and anxiety. Additionally, a negative relationship was found between female student athletes' Facebook use and self-esteem, which su supports previous research findings. Qualitative data was also collected and identified trends between social media use and procrastination, as well as using it as a method to relieve stress and escape reality. The findings provide some preliminary evidence that social media use can have negative impacts on student athletes. Athletic departments have a duty and a need to teach student athletes how to effectively cope with and handle potential online harassment. Our next presenter this evening from the Wan Su Kim College of Fine Arts, Sharbanu Hamza. Hi, my 
an artist and believe art has a special role in protecting human rights by bringing attention and awareness. The slide you are looking at is one of my painting that shows a profile of a woman who is fading into a chaotic background. She's smelling a metal flower. Its leaf is about to cut her throat. Not a lot of movement is possible for her. She doesn't have a say in the things around her. She doesn't have a mouth at all. Is her head still connected to her body? Is she alive? This scene is happening on the surface of a rusty metal door, which also looks like a wounded body. The starting point of my artworks is the imagery of a special type of large metal doors, which were common for houses in Iran when I was a child. Those doors in my painting function as the household skin, and through their damage and oxidation, they depict possible scars, traumas, and laceration suffered by the family within. In 2019, several young women were killed by their fathers in my country. Unfortunately, based on the current laws in Iran, in many situations, femicide is allowed, and there is no justice for those women. This pain made me think of women's safety in their own homes and think of home as a site of trauma. I question the safety of, that those doors are supposed to bring. I think those doors, like many other borders and boundaries, create a paradox in which they provide safety while creating a barrier to aid if one is in need. These contradictions are expressed in my painting through vulnerability, flesh, fluid, and open laceration in contrast with the durability of the cold, rusty, and earthy nature of the metal doors. I use this imagery to explore what is going on behind the closed doors of domestic spaces on one level and to evoke severe and ongoing brutality towards women within the borders of my country on another. To express my perspective, I have utilized home and its relation with the experience of feeling safe. In my view, the human body, domestic space, and the con concept of homeland evoke home on three different levels. Conceptualizing these layers of home, both visually and textually, helps us to understand the suffering that displacement imposes on people, both physical displacement from home and homeland, as well as the one that authorities can create by, enfor by enforcing unjust laws. The goal of my research is to attract attention to the human rights violation in Iran, especially towards women, in the hope of putting an end to them. Thank you. Our next presenter this evening from the College of Arts and Sciences, Kelly Murphy. This year's Super Bowl was historic in many ways, one being the record $2 million grant provided to Super Bowl 55 host Tampa Bay to invest in community initiatives, including education and diversity. Since the early 2000s, professional sport teams have leveraged their positions of influence to engage in efforts that positively affect their communities. Currently, these efforts are not only as important, but are as expected as ever. In my thesis, I analyzed corporate social responsibility messages on social media and how the public responded to them. Corporate social responsibility, or CSR, is broadly defined as the responsibility of an organization to engage in business practices that benefit the organization and the community. In the professional sports sector, this is often operationalized in external community engagement initiatives like hosting charity auctions in Boston, or as you see on the slide, providing food to families in the Bay Area. From a public relations perspective, the importance of these CSR actions is second only to how they are communicated to the public. I posed several research questions in an attempt to answer the following. What types of corporate social responsibility messages garnered the most positive public feedback on social media? My thesis was focused on deciphering the CSR topics shared by professional sport teams on Twitter. My sample was tweets from October 2020 posted by 16 teams across the NFL, NBA, MLB, and NHL. Independent coders coded tweets into 11 mutually exclusive categories, including health and wellness, education, and finance, among others. Once coded for CSR topic, the replies were coded as positive, negative, or neutral, providing an understanding of public response to these messages. Some example replies you see on the slide. My findings indicate that the CSR topics with the highest percentage of positive replies were finance, diversity, and health initiatives. 
while the least positively received messages were employee engagement and business development initiatives. Positive and negative replies provide important insight, and neutral replies provide data about which initiatives have the potential to garner positive reaction from community members. These findings allow professional sport teams to be strategic in selecting which CSR initiatives to implement and how to communicate them to the public. When teams engage in initiatives that are received favorably by the public, such as finance or diversity initiatives, they are helping the community while also increasing fan identification, brand loyalty, and corporate reputation. In an increasingly noisy social media landscape, it is important for PR practitioners to understand what initiatives best connect with their target audiences. As games and practices continue to be reimagined to ensure the safety of teams and fans, my thesis findings underscore the need for teams to understand which CSR initiatives are received positively by their community members. While only one team can win the championship, all teams can make a positive impact in their communities, and my study helps to better understand how this is possible. Thank you. Our next presenter from the College of Arts and Sciences, Megan Donnelly. Let's talk politics. If you're like many Americans, you probably tensed up when I said that. Why? It's probably because of increased hostility we're seeing in politics. This hostility may be due in part to an increase in the attitude right-wing authoritarianism by those in power. Someone who endorses right-wing authoritarianism, obeys strong authority figures, might engage in aggression if condoned by an authority and strongly maintain social norms. Further, they tend to place people in in-groups and out-groups and tend to view out-groups and the world at large as dangerous or threatening. This attitude is associated with prejudice against different groups. And when authority figures reinforce these attitudes, intimidation, hostility, and sometimes violence may occur. Think Proud Boys and neo-Nazis. These tactics aren't limited to politically active adults. They're also observed among school bullies. In fact, school-based hostility has increased since the 2016 presidential election. We know that bullying is a huge problem. So I wanted to study how right-wing authoritarianism impacts teen bullying. I also wanted to look at whether feeling victimized helps explain bullying behavior among those with right-wing authoritarian attitudes. Last, I wanted to see whether moral disengagement impacts this relationship. By moral disengagement, I mean how people can justify, rationalize, or separate themselves from harmful behaviors. One example is victim blaming. They did something to deserve the bullying, so I'm not a bad person for bullying them. This justification, this disengagement, likely contributes to bullying. I surveyed over 200 ninth graders about their right-wing authoritarianism, moral disengagement, and involvement in bullying. We found that students' right-wing authoritarianism was strongly linked to bullying behavior, but only among those students who were most morally disengaged. Students high in right-wing authoritarian attitudes and moral disengagement tended to feel more victimized or aggrieved and reported more bullying behavior. In other words, teens who justify, rationalize, and distance themselves from their harmful behavior and who strongly endorse right-wing authoritarianism are more likely to admit intimidating or harassing others when they themselves feel victimized. This is the first known study that's examined the connection between right-wing authoritarianism and teen bullying behavior. The findings demonstrate that teens are capable of believing in and acting upon these ideologies. Importantly, these findings parallel the adult political science literature. This shows us that hostile political rhetoric may negatively influence teens. It also has important implications for curricula aimed at bullying prevention and reduction. Lastly, understanding how these attitudes influence behavior is imperative in addressing the rampant harassment and abuse seen in the world at large. Thank you. And believe it or not, it's already time for our final presenter this evening from the College of Education, Kate Neely. Picture your high school STEM teachers. This includes science, technology, engineering, and math classes. How many of those teachers look like you? Same race, same gender? If you're white, there's a high likelihood that many teachers come to mind when I ask you that question. If you're a person of color, the chances are significantly lower. Why is this? Our student population continues to get more diverse, but our teachers stay predominantly white. How does that impact our students of color? My research is on the underrepresentation of minorities in STEM education. I've surveyed and interviewed students of color majoring in STEM. 
I've learned about their positive, negative experiences throughout their STEM journey. And I've also asked why they're not interested in pursuing STEM education. My research has two general findings. One reason students of color are not interested in becoming STEM teachers is the negative experiences they had during their K-12 education. The second reason is the low pay of the teaching profession. When analyzing the negative education experiences of students of color, the bigger picture of structural racism in schools becomes incredibly evident. The experiences that students of color have include microaggressions from classmates and teachers, unfair punishment based on their race, being looked over for advanced level classes, and teachers having lower expectations compared to the white counterparts. My many students also described a curriculum that's not culturally relevant to them and the challenge of connecting with their white teachers. The students who persevered through these barriers have strong aspirations to make a difference with their STEM degree, but many are not interested in doing that in education. The second reason students of color are not interested in teaching is the low pay of the teaching profession. There are additional challenges to diversify STEM education compared to other K-12 subjects because there are more lucrative careers in STEM outside of education. Many students said their families would not be supportive if they wanted to pursue teaching because of the high expectations for a more fruitful career when they graduate with their STEM degree. So why is this research important? Why is it essential to have a diverse representation of teachers? There are a handful of students I interviewed who described a generally positive education experience. Many of these students had a diverse group of teachers throughout their STEM journey. They emphasized the importance of having a mentor teacher who helped them discover their passion for STEM and supported them along the way. Having a race congruent teacher not only allows students to build connections with someone with a similar background, it gives students the opportunity to see someone who looks like them succeed in STEM. Majority of students in my research described the importance of having a diverse representation of STEM teachers, whether that was their experience or not. Racial diversity is essential to equity in education. Thank you. Our judges will continue to deliberate for about 10 minutes or so, but in that time, we have a special treat for you. Uh, we want to welcome in Marina Teplova to perform for you on the piano.
Okay, everyone, it's that time. And we again want to thank Marina for her terrific uh, performance tonight. And yes, just to answer you, you did everything exactly as we'd hoped. So thank you uh, once again. And I hope everyone uh, taking this in tonight enjoyed their performance. Um, we want to thank everyone once again, especially our presenters, but it's time finally to announce our winners. And our first announcement is for the second place award winner. And that goes to, from the College of Arts and Sciences, Megan Donnelly. Congratulations, Megan. And it's time now for our first place award, which goes to, from the College of Arts and Sciences, Omni Wise. Congratulations, Omni. And I think we're making a little bit of Illinois State University three minute thesis history tonight because I don't recall, and, and I believe I've been here for each one of these, I don't recall an instance where we've had three separate winners. Our People's Choice Award winner is from the College of Applied Sciences and Technology, Jessica Barrick. Congratulations again, Jessica, Omni, and Megan, as well as to all of our participants this evening. Thank you for making our first ever virtual three minute thesis a big success. And we wish you each all the luck in the world moving forward. Certainly a big thank you to the Graduate School for all of its work, especially behind the scenes and to all of our participants. And we really appreciate you spending some time with us this evening. So we wish you good night and stay safe.